Hey guys, Sneaky Snake here, Brothers in Arms, World of Warships. In today's video, we're going to take a look at a pretty awesome replay that I had in the Lightning, the Tier 8 British Destroyer. I'm playing by myself, and it's some domination here on the map, Shatter. For my captain skills, it's the same build that I have on the Jervis. you got to get that good gumbo build going with Superintendent for the extra heal and hydro. Demolition Expert, of course, uh, for the pretty good fire chance that you can make out of the British DDs, getting up to 11% with the fire flags and demo expert, and of course BFT as well, so you can get that faster rate of fire. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty standard build, at least in my opinion, for the British destroyers, and it's one that does me pretty good. Now, uh, the Lightning here in World of Warships is a pretty nice upgrade over the Jervis at Tier 7. And the chief reason is due to the guns. Now, it's still the same caliber at 120 millimeters. However, there are a few noticeable differences. There's, well, two of them. The first one is that the base reload goes from 5 to 4.5 seconds. And while that's still a long-ish reload for a gunboat, 4.5 seconds is still going to be much nicer than the 5 seconds that you're used to on the Jervis. However, it's the second thing that's much more important. All of the turrets, not just the rear turret, are 360 degree traversing turrets. So what this means is that switching from port to starboard and vice versa, uh, well, you're able to do so much quicker than a Jervis would. And if you do get into an engagement with, say, a Jervis or other destroyers, uh, you're able to get your guns on target and then say things change and you got to quickly switch to the other side. It's not nearly as painful as it would be on that tier 7 British DD. So uh, the gun power is definitely better at the expense of the torpedoes. While technically they're upgrades, they do have a longer range of 8 kilometers than 7. Uh, you only have 8 of them instead of 10. So no longer are you able to uh, go up to full health battleships, say, if you're able to get the drop on them and guarantee a full health deletion with only 8 torpedoes at least against the higher tier ones that you are going to face, and you will face tier 10s, it's not necessarily guaranteed anymore with these torpedoes. Um, however, the stealth is fantastic. A great upgrade to 5.5 kilometers with a full concealment build uh, makes the Lightning one of the stealthiest destroyers in its matchmaking bracket, not just at its tier, so this thing is easily able to play the spotting game uh, to a good degree. And it also, of course, still has the great British maneuverability with the insane acceleration, the tight turning circle, and the very quick rudder shift time. So, that's enough about the Lightning. Let's take a look here at this gameplay. The reason why I decided to go to the 9 line very early on, which is east of C on this map, uh, is simply because it provides uh, a good area to spot the enemy ships that are coming towards the sea cap. And it doesn't matter whether you spawn on the south side or the north side of this objective point. Going out wide like this, you're able to get spots on enemy ships. Um, doing so, you can see I have the Massachusetts spotted. I'm going to get the Turpet spotted here in a little bit. Um, and it, even though the enemy team is not pushing heavy on this side of the map, getting out to this open water allows you to get spotting on the enemy team. And also when you're this far to the east, uh, assuming that enemy radar cruisers try to push into sea, you are still far enough away that at least for British and American radar, you're going to be uh, right outside or just slightly inside their radar uh, range so you can quickly get out of dodge if need be. And overall, it provides um, you know, a lot of information to your team if you know how to uh, spot correctly. So I'm going to smoke up here for my first smoke of the game and get some shots downrange at the Akazuki. Uh, the friendly Wooster, it appears, is hydroing the guy or maybe radaring. I'm not sure. Uh, but certainly being able to take hit points away from this guy uh, without him really being able to retaliate is very important because the Akazuki is one of your counters at Tier 8. That is not a ship that you want to get into a one-on-one -on -one with. Well, to be fair... There's hardly any DD in the game that wants to, uh, but definitely an Akazuki can give you a pretty big headache. Now you're going to see, however, I'm now switching my focus uh, over here to the Massachusetts, getting some good shots into the superstructure. There is an argument to be made to run the IFHE skill with the 120mm guns. I don't personally see the point because I prefer the fire chance, which, as I mentioned earlier, you can get up to 11%, which is great. I prefer to go with the fire chance ability, uh, more so than the raw damage that the HE shells could produce. But you saw right there on the Massachusetts, as long as you shoot nice and high into the superstructure, you're still going to get those good penetrating hits and deal a considerable amount of damage. And you can see that the Massachusetts is still taking quite a bit of hits there. 
appears from my friend in the Bismarck. There's also, of course, the Minotaur and the Wooster, which I believe have gotten some shells at him as well. So this guy is in a world of hurt. My fire continues to burn, and now I'm going to use my next smoke screen. And here's something else for the destroyer players out there. When you are sub seven kilometers, I'd say, um, maybe even sub eight or nine, against cruisers and battleships that are full broadside, switch to the AP. 1,815 for the first salvo, over 2,000 and a broken AA mount for the second one. Another good salvo of 1,600. He goes undetected. The next AP salvo, I manage over 2,000 damage right there. And then the very last one, I'm going to sink right underneath the superstructure and kill off that tier 8 premium American battleship. Um, but it's not just Soviet DDs that can make use of their armor-piercing shot. When you're at those close ranges, you're easily able to score penetrations against the front of the bow, the rear of the stern. Well, that was pretty bad English. What I mean is, like, uh, around the athwart ship. So uh, you're able to get good penetrating damage in those areas. And then, of course, above the belt armor, uh, but below the superstructure, when you hit into that really weak area, you're also able to get full penetrations with your AP and deal a good bit of damage. And, of course, this thing is a gumbo to heart. The damage will stack up pretty nicely over time. Now, that Minotaur is just outside of my torpedo range, at least according uh, to his last reported distance away from me, 8.1. But he did set a smoke screen, and of course there was also the enemy Akazuki over there as well, who does just get detected. So I'm dropping those torpedoes in the hopes that I may tag one or both of those ships that are in the smoke. However, I'm now going to go back to damage farming and trying to help my team kill this Turpitz, who is making a very, very ballsy charge into Wooster and a Bismarck, and then of course myself. And once again, you're going to see here, as the shells do fall in on the superstructure of the Bismarck, you're going to uh, witness some very good high explosive uh, damage here with the Alpha Strike hitting right into the very meaty portion. And German battleships as a, as a whole really do struggle when they are uh, constantly focused by these British destroyers because the superstructures are so big and you have the great fire chance see the hit counter on the right side 26 pens only 16 shell breaks I'm having about a two to one ratio a little bit less than that of pens to non pens so again dealing that raw damage which is uh, what you're going to need to do uh, to be able to uh, whittle away their hit points so our team in the meantime has managed to get a couple kills in quick succession and this turpitz is dead he just doesn't know it yet you don't push into a whole bunch of ships like this and expect to come out alive uh, but you can see now that we're still trying to take over the C objective. The enemy team has been um, capturing, or they've been holding B for quite some time. Nobody is in possession of A at the moment, so this game is still anyone's game. The enemy team has actually lost four ships compared to R2, but unfortunately both of the ships that we've lost have been destroyers. So it's up to me and somebody else who is at the Harigumo on the other side of the map to stay alive and still provide our team the ability to cap. Now, this is a very dangerous play right here, and I thought about going for the Torpedo Salvo, but I decided against it and switched to the AP. However, you can see that even at this little angle that he's at, I'm shooting way too far behind, and all of my shells are non-penetrating or ricocheting. you got to go for the very tip of the bow to guarantee the overpens, or like I said, just in front of the athwart ship, where I shot right there, just in front of the A turret, where you're able to get those full-on pens. Even at battleships at point-blank range, they are not able to stand up to your AP shot. So you saw a great example of where not to shoot with AP, and then where to shoot as I finished off the kill. So at the moment, it's 58,000 damage I've been able to deal, and two frags so far. Um, now we're getting some shots here at the enemy Charles Martel, who for whatever reason, decided to reverse in front of a Wooster and a Bismarck. You can see the Bismarck secondaries are going to town as well. I'm getting some shots into him. I did set one fire, but it's the next salvo that's going to count. I get a whole bunch of shells to hit right at the stern of the ship, and I do manage to knock out his steering gears. So that Charles Martel is going to be uh, in some pretty dire straits here. You can see that he is turning to the right now because I knocked out his steering, uh, which is kind of funny. So I think he has to come to a stop or something like that. Or maybe he's actually going to run into the island. You can see that he just continues to turn to the right. That's actually pretty funny. Uh, so he's actually going to end up beaching himself, I believe. Now he's got his steering gears back up now. Uh, but he's sitting right in front of the friendly Minotaur, which is, of course, not good whatsoever. However, I still have to be careful about trying to go in and dealing with the uh, ships that are right here. There's the Haragumo, only four and a half kilometers away. But the Minotaur is still within uh, critical 
distance of me. If I were to get spotted about eight kilometers away from the Minotaur, it would pretty much be game over for me. So that's why I decided to circle back around. But now that I see that the Minotaur is actually going to be moving now to the south and away from my position, I'm going to circle back around once again, and I'm going to try to get into a position where I can try to dig that Haragumo out. And the Haragumo is even more of a threat to you than the Akazuki would be, because of course the even faster reload with 10 instead of 8 of those guns, when you're trying to deal with those Japanese gunboats, um, you know, you really have to try and attack them when they are not being able to focus on you, when they're not able to pay attention to you. You saw with the Akazuki's case, I was able to smoke up and shoot him from the security of the stealth that I had, and now, in this case, as the Haragumo is being shot at uh, by the Wooster and somebody else, I'm going to go in and get some shots at him when he's not able to pay attention to me. And you see right there, after two good meaty alpha strikes with the HE, I pick up my third frag of the game on that tier 10 Japanese DD, and finally, we're going to be able to capture this C objective point. However, taking a look on the other side of the minimap right now, the Haragumo is being chased down by a Jutland, a Des Moines, and any second, a Chung Mu. There we go. They're all chasing that guy down. He is not long for this world. So at this point, what we have to do here is kill the Minotaur in B, get C for our team taken care of, and then move on the objective point and try to get two caps to one and see what we can do here as we reach the 845 mark left in the game. Now that Minotaur does take a pretty big hit from the friendly Yamato that is southwest of me. However, the Minotaur does kick the bucket from the enemy Minotaur, uh, so that's not good. And then the Haragumo dies. So right now it's a four versus five. We're down 154 to 553, and of course the enemy team has two caps to one. So basically, all of us over here that were finally able to take care of the C objective, we now need to go into B and try to make a play. And what you're going to see here for the rest of the replay is something that you don't normally see all that often when you're playing by yourself. And I would like to absolutely commend the Bismarck, the Wooster, and the Yamato for this sequence. We're all going to team up here and make a play on B and see what happens. But it's going to be coordinated and we're going to do as good as we can. Now you can see here, the first target that needs to die is of course the Minotaur, and he is going to kick the bucket from our buddy in the Bismarck, so good job by him, now making it a 4 versus 4. The next target of course is going to be the enemy Yamato, uh, the Des Moines, the Jutland, and the Chungmu. It's going to take them some time to get back after killing the friendly Haragumo, so in the meantime, this battleship needs to die, and of course you can see he's coming under the sustained fire of myself, the Wooster, the Bismarck. Bismarck's secondaries, excuse me, and then any second now, this Yammy is going to get slammed in the cheek from our friendly Yammy, there we go, a big meaty hit, chucking off about half of his remaining hit points, so this guy is also absolutely dead, and I kind of was a little salty that my torpedo did not manage to hit the front of his bow, but as we all know in this game, whenever you drop torpedoes on bow on battleships, there's always those nice BB-sized gaps uh, to be able to uh, sail through, so... Regardless of that, the Wooster is actually in a great position behind me. The Yamato and the Bismarck are perma-detecting him, of course, because they're, clo they're close to him. But this Wooster is actually able to shoot just over the corner of the island and still be safe from his return fire. So that's great positioning by the Wooster. And this guy is going to go down any second now. There we go. As the guy from ARP kills off that Yamato. So now we're in a four versus three. Sure, the enemy team does have two destroyers and one Des Moines left, but we still have two battleships, so what that means is that there is plenty of hit points for us to soak up, or I should say, for those guys to soak up, so that maybe me and the Wooster can move in, he can get within radar range, and uh, we can try to kill off those enemy destroyers. So, we still got a good amount of time left, about six minutes. Obviously, um, we're still quite a bit behind, so we do need to make a play happen, but... Obviously, those enemy ships are going to come back to the vicinity of B and try to hold off our assault. Now, you can see that both the Bismarck and the Yamato are both moving uh, together, and I'm going to try and get out in front of the screen. I still have about a minute left of my hydroacoustic search. I didn't mention it at the beginning of the replay, but we all know that the British Hydro lasts for three minutes and detects everything at three kilometers. So, uh, the hydroacoustic helping the Bismarck out just in the nick of time as those Chung Mu torpedoes that came through. I did not manage to land on him, and now you can see that the Des Moines has set up shop about to the west of the B-cap, and now the Cheng Mu is set up to the northwest of the B-cap. So, at this point, what needs to happen is that the Wooster needs to get within radar range of that enemy destroyer. We need to be able to get a frag on at least that DD, so then our battleships can try and push through the B-cap 
and really pressure that Des Moines. Now we know where the enemy Jutland is because you can see where the Des Moines is at. There's another set of guns coming. So we know where all three of these enemy ships are located at. And at this point, it's just a question of getting this Wooster into a position to be able to radar so that we're able to try and kill those guys. Now this Bismarck is going to make a very selfless play. You can see that he's side scraping the corner world of tank style. All of those single shot torpedoes from the Jutland are passing by. Unfortunately, two of them just managed to hit his ship. He gets put down to one hit points of all things. <laughs> he's going to kick the bucket here. But what the Bismarck did is buy us a little bit of time. And while it might not seem like that here right now, that Bismarck going in there and taking some damage, we were obviously able to get a little bit done on the Chung Mu. But now that this Chung Mu, his torpedoes are being reloaded, he can't sit there because the Wooster is in radar position. So that Bismarck bought us enough time to get the Wooster up to use the radar. And now he has to get out of dodge. Now, the Wooster is pushing in as well, and you can see that he also has the Jutland under his surveillance radar. So, at this point, he is doing all that he can to deal damage to that guy. You can see that the Des Moines is still back in that position, probably afraid of where the Yamato is, so he wants to stay um, in a position where our guy is probably not going to be able to get him. But now our battleship is pushing through as well. So we are going to get this B-cap. It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. I'm getting a good salvo downrange at the Chung Mu, and this is very important. Long range accuracy, 9.5 kilometers, 5 hits, about 2,000 damage, and a fire set on that guy. That is going to come in handy a little bit later on in this replay. However, we know that the Jutland took a lot of damage, and even with the heal, I'm going to have a significant amount of hit points over him. So, even though my Hydro's down, I gotta keep pushing through. The Jutland gets detected on fire at about 1,000 hit points. I get my front guns off. And I do manage to pick up the solo base cap, and I also kill off the destroyer, and I'm easily able to dodge his torpedo salvo as well. So now the Wooster and I are going to try and head around the corner. Now, at this last stage of the replay, the play of the Des Moines here is certainly going to be in question. He has two options. He can continue to reverse in open water, trying to account for the fact that most likely myself and the Wooster are going to come down uh, the channel that we're in right now, and that he'll be bow on to us, or he can maybe move a little bit forward. Um, but right now, the Yamato is actually pushing through the B-cap, and I told the Yamato, I pinged the map at E4, you need to go through the other channel, because then we're going to be able to come through two different ways at once, and this Des Moines is going to be in quite a pickle. The second thing, using islands, getting as close to them as I can, I'm now able to take advantage of my three-kilometer hydroacoustic, and even though it has pitiful range compared to the Germans, we now know where this Des Moines is at, and he is so close to me that even though I'm going to get hard detected at under two kilometers right here, well, it doesn't matter because my torpedoes are reloaded and all I have to do is go around the corner and dump them on this guy. I am going to eat one salvo right here as I do take quite a bit of damage, but that's okay. He tries to go for the ram. I anticipate his movements, drop my torpedoes on him, and then as I pick up the Kraken, I get my salvo off on the Chung Mu at five and a half kilometers, and I pick up the double strike as that ends the game here on Shadow. Alrighty guys, taking a look at the post-battle results, 463,400 credits received, 12,800 total experience earned, this was my first win of the day. I picked up Devastating Strike, Double Strike, and Kraken Unleashed, dealing 131,000 points of damage off of 287 shell hits and 4 torpedoes. I sank half of the enemy team, set 10 fires, had 3 base defense ribbons, 1 solo cap, and one assisted base capture. Unfortunately, I forgot to print screen the rest of the screenshots, but I did have about 2,900 base experience, and in a tier 10 game where you have no teammates to rely on for support, well, this was a pretty awesome result. And much like the, uh, the Jervis so far, I really haven't had any monster damage games in these in this in the lightning, but I have had very good and consistent results. And this is definitely the apex of those results. Uh, but nevertheless, still very good. And in tier 10 matchmaking, where it's very difficult to utilize the 8 kilometer range torpedoes, I was still able to make my presence felt at multiple cap circles. And then with the timely support of my team at the end, so a good shout out there to the Wooster, the Yamato, and the Bismarck, we were able to take the game by the horns and finish it off in style with the win. So I hope you guys enjoyed this replay as much as I certainly had playing in it. Please like the video, comment on it, subscribe to the channel, all of those things you guys do for us, we really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Thank you.